This video is brought to you by Blinkist. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com forward slash geographics will get one week to try it out. You'll also get 25% off if you want the full membership, which you probably will. And let's get into it. Dien Bien Phu, Northern Vietnam. It's a small town at the center of a valley of the same name, a landscape of rolling hills surrounded by a natural amphitheater of mountains. The area is covered in luscious vegetation and rice paddies arranged in terraces. At dawn and dusk, the shallow waters in the paddies reflect sunlight in a variety of pastel tones. Another name for the valley is Myong Sen. In the local language, this means land of heaven, and it's a well-deserved title. The Heavenly Valley was the scene for one of the bloodiest battles of the post-World War II era, a time marked by Cold War tensions and the unstoppable wave of decolonization. For 56 days in the spring of 1954, General Vo Nguyen Diep commanded 50,000 Vietnamese soldiers who fought for their independence against 15,000 French troops. And I will just here note that the pronunciation on this one is going to be tricky. A lot of these names are not available in my usual dictionary, so I'm attempting to do it with Google Translate's pronunciation and, well, we'll see how it goes. Hell rained down upon the land of heaven in one of history's fiercest sieges, the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. The town of Dien Bien Phu, capital of Dien Bien Province, is located in North Vietnam, less than 10 kilometers east of the border with Laos. The Vietnamese capital, Hanoi, is another 600 kilometers east. The best way to get to Dien Bien Phu today is to take a flight with Vietnam Airlines from Hanoi. It will take less than an hour, and it will cost you about $100. According to local myths, the Myong Sang Valley was formed at the time when heaven and earth were created, hence its angelic nickname. The valley is punctuated by several gently sloping hills and surrounded by high mountains, with the largest being Pu Hong Meo and Pu Hong Tai. This natural amphitheater extends for an area greater than 1,500 square kilometers, placing it among the four largest and richest valleys of Vietnam in terms of natural resources and agricultural capacity. The hill slopes and mountainsides are covered with rice plantations arranged in terraces that look like massive staircases. The best time to visit the valley is September. This is when the ripe rice colors the landscape in yellow and fills the air with a sweet perfume. Rice is of vital importance here. Thanks to the fertility brought by the Nam Rom River, Myong Than Valley has held a reputation as the breadbasket, or rather the rice bowl, of North Vietnam. In 1841, the province received its current name, Dien Bien, by the ruling Nguyen dynasty. This toponym means stable land in the border and reflects one of the other primary functions of the valley, to guard the border area with the Kingdom of Lao. So, we just heard two reasons why this area could hold a strategic value within an armed conflict. It's a center for the production of vital supplies and it allows strategic access to a border area. It's no wonder then that the Dien Bien Phu Valley became the epicenter of the battle that marked the end of an era. The Battle of Dien Bien Phu took place from March the 13th through May the 7th in 1954. The French side was about 15,000 strong, and it included elite troops such as paratroopers and foreign legionnaires. The bulk of the force, up to 70% of the personnel, was made up of colonial troops recruited from North and West Africa, as well as South Vietnamese allies. So whenever I say French, I mean the French allies and colonial soldiers directed by French officers. The garrison was under the command of Colonel de Castries and his subordinates, Lieutenant Colonel Langlais, who headed the paratroopers, and Lieutenant Colonel Piroff, who managed the artillery. They would square off with a local army led by the charismatic General Sepp, a former history teacher and turned leader of the Viet Minh, the League for the Independence of Vietnam. Sepp also commanded the regular old Pavan, or People's Army of Vietnam. Before we dive into that hellish siege, let me give you some historical context. French intervention in Southeast Asia dated back to 1858 and the rule of Napoleon III, a man whose fingers were always in search of pies to sink into. In 1887, the territories of Cambodia, Laos, Cochinchin, Annam, and Tonkin were all consolidated as French Indochina. Later in the early 1930s, the movement for independence gained momentum under the leadership of Ho Chi Minh, founder of the Indochinese Communist Party and of the Viet Minh. 
Minh in September 1941. During World War II, the Viet Minh guerrillas harassed the French, then later the Japanese occupiers, culminating with the proclamation of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam on September 2, 1945. One month later, French troops returned to reclaim southern Vietnam, supported by British, Indian, and even Japanese forces who continued to clash with Vietnamese separatists. In 1946, a conference was convened to decide the future of Indochina, but the French and Vietnamese delegation couldn't reach any compromise. This was followed by the Haiphong incident of November the 21st, when fighting broke out between French colonial troops and Viet Minh fighters. This marked the beginning of the First Indochina War. After seven years of fighting, the French controlled Saigon and the Red River Delta, but most of northern Vietnam was held by the Viet Minh, threatening the bordering Kingdom of Laos, a French protectorate. French leadership had realized that they could not control the country indefinitely, so their plan was to recapture as much territory as possible in order to lead negotiations with Vietnamese nationalists from a position of strength. In November of 1953, a French general named Henri Navarre conceived the strategy of establishing an airhead or airborne bridgeheads in the village of Dien Bien Phu. The village had been selected because it was the center of food production for independentist forces in the north, and holding it would prevent the Viet Minh from invading Laos. As an added bonus, the presence of an old Japanese airstrip would make the delivery of supplies much easier. From a fortified base, equipped with strong artillery and air power, the French would cajole the Viet Minh into accepting an open battle. This would put the Vietnamese at a disadvantage, as their strengths lay in smaller, hit-and-run guerrilla tactics. This French approach of superior firepower was dubbed the Strategy of the Hedgehog. On November 20, 1953, Operation Castor was a go. French commands began landing paratroopers and heavy equipment in the Dien Bien Phu Valley to initiate the setup of their fortified base. The paras met with strong resistance from a Viet Minh unit, whom they overcame after five hours of heavy fighting. Besides this one hiccup, work proceeded as planned, and the airstrip was repaired. The French base consisted of a large perimeter, intended to be fortified with trenches and palisades. The perimeter enclosed several strong points or defensive positions built on and around pre-existing hills. These positions were christened with ladies' names. Dominique, Elaine, Claudine, Anne-Marie, and Huguet, among others. Of these, Huguet was to be the largest of the strong points, structured as a bastion to protect the vital airstrip, the umbilical cord which ensured continuity of supplies and the landing of fresh reinforcements. Three outposts would be located well outside the main perimeter. Gabriel and Beatrice to the north of the main camp were the main forward artillery positions. From here, the batteries of Lieutenant Colonel Peroth looked able to easily spot and pummel incoming enemies. The third outpost, Isabel, was the most distant and isolated from the center of the base. Located to the south, Isabel would be garrisoned by arguably the toughest troops the Foreign Legion. A week after Operation Castor, commanding Colonel de Castries landed in Dien Bien Phu to take charge of the proceedings. Well, in theory at least. In practice, he still had to wait for orders from his superiors, the mastermind General Navarre and his deputy General Cogney, commander of the North Vietnamese Theatre. These two head honchos were not exactly aligned. Navarre's battle plan was to entrench his troops in Dien Bien Phu, lure the Viet Minh to attack, and then pound them with artillery and aerial bombing. In other words, he was all in on the hedgehog. Cogney, on the other hand, wanted to use the base to launch anti-guerrilla operations in enemy territory. The consequences of this indecision were disastrous. On one hand, the perimeter was not fully fortified as intended, as the garrison was busy with anti-guerrilla actions away from the camp. On the other hand, the half-committed sorties ordered by Cogney proved ineffective and resulted in heavy casualties. So, by the 26th of December, Colonel de Castries had put an end to further forward actions, and the garrison had become a sitting duck within a lightly fortified perimeter. Perimeter. Making matters worse, the artillery pieces under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Peroth were sitting in the open, neither protected nor concealed by bunkers or other fortifications. Another fatal error of the French generals was that they had severely underestimated the Viet Minh and the Pavan. The natives were considered unable to field any heavy armaments due to the lack of roads and impenetrable vegetation surrounding the valley. Unbeknownst to then, General Zepp's forces had been silently surrounding their position. The French may have occupied some high grounds within the 
the valley, but Ziep engineered his own topographical advantage by occupying an even higher ground, the mountains around Dien Bien Phu. The Viet Minh and the Pavan had utilized some serious logistical might to encircle the French. Nearly 80,000 soldiers and civilians, including women and children, had patiently disassembled dozens of artillery pieces and transported them across 500 miles of jungle, sometimes even by bicycle. Ironically, these were French-made Peugeot bikes. Among Sieb's tenacious artillerymen, one of them had a special assignment that was blowing stuff up. Fan Tam was a 22-year-old graduate of the Hanoi Academy of Fine Arts. Armed with pencils, ink, and watercolor, he was tasked with documenting his impressions of the battle in a series of sketches for posterity. He drew the vegetation, scorched by the shelling, his starving, terrified, unvanquished brothers-in-arms, and, of course, the ever-present spectacle of death. When he wasn't capturing the scenes around him, Tam and his comrades were reassembling the artillery pieces on the hills and skillfully camouflaging them using the surrounding foliage. Some batteries were placed in underground positions with only the barrels sticking out of the ground. Back down in the valley, by March the 13th, 1954, at 1700 hours, the French defenses were imperfect but completed. And it was exactly at that moment when Ziab's carefully set up artillery discharged a deluge of shells over Beatrice Hill, scoring a direct hit on the command's bunker and killing several officers. The shelling was followed by an infantry assault, which the French resisted fiercely. But it was all in vain. By midnight, Beatrice had been lost and more than 500 French defenders lay dead. The following day, the Viet Minh and Pavan attacked Gabrielle Hill for 15 hours non-stop. By the end of the assault, they had lost 4,000 men, but the French had to retreat to Anne-Marie and Huguet. During the arduous defense of Gabrielle, Lieutenant Colonel Peroth, commander of the artillery, retreated to his bunker. A one-armed, tough-as-nails veteran, he had reassured his superiors that his artillery would make mincemeat of the enemy. And yet, in barely two days of battle, his batteries had already lost two strongholds. Overwhelmed with guilt and shame, Peroth clutched a hand grenade to his chest. He had already removed the pin, and he did not bother counting up to ten. In the meantime, Vietnamese shells had been pounding the old airfield, destroying aircraft, and leaving the French defenders stranded and without local air support. Some reinforcements arrived by parachute drops, but these were offset by the desertion of some colonial troops and local allies. The French also had to contend with a growing number of wounded, overcrowding the small field hospital. Among the medics, a young volunteer nurse would make headlines. She was Genevieve de Galar, the angel of Dien Bien Phu. Genevieve performed everything short of miracles to treat and comfort her dear wounded. They would call her Our Blue Eyes. She later recalled how a young German legionnaire, Hans Hartz, had told her, When all this is over, Genevieve, I will take you dancing. Unfortunately, Hans lost both of his legs in combat. Hans was among some 1,300 Germans fighting for the French Foreign Legion at Dien Bien Phu. Another notable German legionnaire was Staff Sergeant Rolf Rodel. While serving at the Isabel outpost, he was wounded four times, and every time he returned to his post. One of Rodel's young subordinates was 21-year-old Italian Antonio Carco, who documented the action at Isabel in his diary entries. Antonio described the incessant rain of artillery shells pounding the legionnaires and admitted that if God doesn't have mercy on us, it's going to be a real massacre. His diary was published posthumously as he was being shot while dragging a wounded friend to safety. So just before we continue with today's video, I do want to tell you about the sponsor for this episode, and that is Blinkist. Now look, it's not always easy to find time and sit down and read all the books that you want to. I'm a pretty busy dude myself. This is definitely something that I can relate to. I used to read a lot. I read less just because I have less time. But the good news is that I have Blinkist, which is this app that you can download. And then it's basically just 15 minute summaries of all the best non-fiction books that there are. There's over 3,000 books on this app, by the way. You can either read or listen to them. Me, 90% of the time, I listen. I listen kind of when I'm going to or from work or just pottering around the house, that sort of thing. It's really easy to just fit a little bit of audio in during your day, or if you prefer to read, of course, you can do that as well. There's 12 million active users currently using Blinkist, and like I say, thousands of books to choose from. Self-help to business to health, whatever you're into, it's on there. And I was thinking, you know, this video is all about, well, battles and war, and I was like, I wonder if they've got, you know, military content on there. And so I looked it up, and they absolutely do. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com forward slash geographics, you'll get a week to try out Blinkist, and you'll also get 25% off if you want the full membership. Again, seven-day trial, Blinkist.com forward slash geographics and let's get back to the video.
Over the last days of March and into early April, Zeb launched more and more attack waves, which gradually wore down the defenders. Their numbers were reduced to below 2,600 combat-ready troops. The losses on the Viet Minh side were equally exacting, as they were losing an average of 700 men every single day. Zeb decided to abandon frontal attacks in favor of trench warfare tactics. Before the siege, his secret weapon had been the bicycle. Now, it was going to be the shovel. Zeb's troops dug a network of trenches and tunnels around the Dien Ben Phu perimeter. They would get as close as possible to the French without incurring any of the heavy defensive fire that was responsible for so much of the carnage. In this way, the Vietnamese could better manage their staggering daily troop losses. While Zieb was tightening the noose, his gunners ensured the French garrison had their supply lines completely cut off. By the 14th, the airstrip was completely destroyed. The artillery strikes also blew up tons of rations, cheese, coffee, chocolate, and the garrison's entire stash of tobacco went up in flames. The French Air Force still tried to airdrop supplies, but the Viet Minh's anti-aerial guns were dead accurate, scoring 55 hits in April alone. A defector later revealed that the AA batteries were supported by Chinese advisers. It became clear after a while that the frontline sides in the conflict were fighting a proxy war on behalf of the main blocs in the Cold War. Soviets and Chinese were supporting Xiap and Ho Chi Minh, providing advisors, howitzers, and even Katyusha rocket launchers. On the other side, the US military had been supporting the French by providing financing weapons and ammunition, as well as committing aircraft for supply drops. In President Eisenhower's view, the loss of Vietnam to communist control would have led to similar communist victories in neighboring countries in Southeast Asia, India, Japan, and even Australia and New Zealand. This became known as domino theory. In April, U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles had been contemplating a more direct intervention. This was known as Operation Vulture. The plan involved a direct aerial attack on Siap, with a potential added side element of tactical nukes. Facing opposition from the Joint Chiefs and from President Eisenhower himself, Dulles aborted the plan on April the 29th. Two days later, on May the 1st, it was Labor Day for the Vietnamese, a date of great significance for communists worldwide. This is when Siap unleashed his final wave of attacks under heavy rain. On May the 6th, at 184500 hours, a Viet Minh infantry attack swamped Elaine Hill. The attack was marked by the detonation of a huge charge by the Viet Minh, roughly one metric ton of explosives, and it blew up a French command bunker and buried dozens of paratroopers. The hill eventually fell after 10 hours of fierce fighting. Pavan Lieutenant Colonel Nugent Dun Chi later recalled, The assault ended in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. We couldn't see anything any longer. We didn't try to take aim. We just moved forward, jumping from trench to trench, stepping on bodies. May the 7th was the last day of the battle. After Elaine had been lost to the Viet Minh, Colonel de Castries decided to negotiate a ceasefire to begin at 1700. At 1730, the Viet Minh entered the officer's bunker and captured him. At 1750-100 hours, the officers in Hanoi received the last radio message from Dien Bien Phu. We're blowing up everything. Adieu. Colonel Chi remembered the eerie atmosphere of the end. Silence has fallen on Dien Bien Phu. It stank, the smell of death and rotting flesh. The French suffered 2,000 casualties, including those who were killed and wounded in action. A further 11,000 were captured, 4,000 of which died while being marched to a North Vietnamese POW camp. On the other side, Chiap's army lost a staggering number of soldiers, with 8,000 killed and 15,000 wounded. Both sides of the battle had etched the heavenly landscapes of Dien Bien Phu with their deeds of heroism, sacrifice, and tenacity. Ultimately, superiority in numbers and strategy had given the edge to the Vietnamese. The defeat of the French marked the beginning of the end for French colonialism in Indochina and elsewhere. As the dust settled, the Geneva Conference kicked off to discuss the future of Indochina. Unsurprisingly, public pressure forced a newly appointed French cabinet to pull out of the region. Vietnam was thus divided in two halves along the 17th parallel. A communist Vietnam in the north under Ho Chi Minh was opposed by a South Vietnam supported by the United States, which had become the most influential Western power in the area. The old colonial masters had left the country, but the road to complete independence was still several battles away for the Vietnamese people. What is the fate of a battlefield, especially one that changed world history? The name and memory of the Battle of Dien Bien Phu remained cast in iron within the collective memory of Vietnam, but the physical sites of Dien Bien Phu were not as well maintained, preserved, or celebrated, neither by the victors nor the defeated. After the French were defeated, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam ordered some of their troops to remain in the area for reasons of border security. 
They lived in tattered, thatched huts scattered across the valley, mixing with the locals and surviving on rice and vegetables that were collected in the forests. The area remains largely undeveloped until 1986, when an economic policy of renovation breathed new life into Vietnam's economy, incentivizing local private businesses. Proximity to the huge Chinese market also contributed to the growth of the town from a few thousand to 150,000 today. But even following this boom, very few Vietnamese visited Dien Bien Phu. As for French tourists or tourists of other nationalities who had fought with the French, their presence was even scarcer. To be fair, a small French war memorial had been built in the valley in the 1980s, but by 1992 a visiting veteran found it in ruins. He was Rolf Rodel, the German staff sergeant at Isabel. Rolf rebuilt the memorial on his own, at his own expense, over the course of eight days. Two years later, in 1994, he returned to build a brand new war memorial. Memorial. It took five years for French authorities to finally give official recognition to Rolf's memorial. Unfortunately, Sergeant Rodel had already died in January of 1999. When the 50th anniversary of the battle approached, the tourism patterns suddenly changed in the valley. The Vietnamese took notice and flocked to the Land of Heaven in a major historical pilgrimage. In 2003, 100,000 tourists came to visit the site, a huge number that still increased by an additional 25,000 the following year. This was a godsend for the town's businesses. After the growth of the 1980s, the economy had begun to stagnate. Tourism revenue in 2004 raked in about 2 million US dollars in revenue for local businesses, but the town could have done much better. The problem was that much of the heritage and cultural landscape related to the battle had since been destroyed. New roads had been built up on those same hills that had once rendered the province so heavenly and the battle so infernal. Most trenches dug by Jap's freedom fighters didn't exist anymore. Many buildings from the French camp had crumbled due to lack of maintenance and then were incorrectly reconstructed. Most of all, the rapid, sprawling expansion of the city had changed the morphology of the battlefield. But following the revival of the mid-2000s, local government authorities became aware of the significance of the battle sites and recognized that any plan for the development of Dien Bien Phu needed to take heritage protection into account. For example, the Planning Commission decided to halt the construction of a major road which was originally designed to cut through an iconic battle location, the bunker of Colonel de Castries. This bunker was partially reconstructed with concrete replacing the original timber and a large translucent canopy protecting it from the weather. It's open to visitors alongside the memorial that we mentioned earlier and other key locations of the battle. Tourists can walk around the trenches dug by Xiap soldiers or even the large crater left by the massive blast at Elaine Hill indicated as A1 Hill on tour guides. For visitors that don't mind blatant propaganda, the Victory Museum features a collection of relics and artifacts from the siege. There are also some interesting dioramas and reconstructions of key events. For example, the moment in which the Viet Minh troops removed the French tricolor from Colonel de Castries' bunker and replaced it with their own red flag, a moment which never actually happened. For more of the real deal, tourists can take a short drive outside of the town and take a hike in the General Forest, a plot of woodlands where General Giap had set up his headquarters. Visitors have a chance to traverse a 69-meter-long tunnel where the general discussed strategy with his staff or climb on the botch tower from where the leader observed the French fortifications and directed his next attack. A further commemoration activity was instituted by the local government in 2014, the Ban Flower Festival. This event is named after the Ban, or Bauhinia Veringata, the most beautiful flower found in the valley. Originally, though, this festival was conceived to celebrate the landmark Vietnamese victory, and the inauguration of its first edition coincided with the first day of the battle, the 13th of March. In recent years, the attention of the festival has shifted to the celebration of the cultural values of the Dien Bien province and especially to the cultures of the 19 different ethnic groups living in the area. It includes contests of traditional costumes, folk games, traditional song, and dances. Noted Vietnam scholar Stanley Carnout described the Battle of Dien Bien Phu as one of the greatest military engagements of history, along with Agincourt, Waterloo, and Gettysburg. The consequences of the battle had a lasting impact on the history of the 20th century. The siege has been widely studied, narrated, and celebrated in literature, academia, and popular culture, so there is little chance that it will be forgotten. A battle, however, is more than just a collection of lines and arrows on a map, more than just a list of decisions taken by high ranking officers. The history of these landmark events includes the lives and sacrifices of those who took part in it from both sides of the trenches. It includes actual physical sites as well as the scars left on the earth 
by the weapons of man. All this is what was at risk of being forgotten and neglected at Dien Bien Phu, thanks to the efforts of people like Sergeant Rodal as well as the recent decisions taken by the Dien Bien local authorities, this risk is averted for now. From our side, I hope we've done our part, as small as it may be, to remember this event. And I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, do check out the fantastic sponsor for this episode, Blinkist, link below. And thank you for watching.